Hey, everybody. Uh, if you're like me, you are tired of paying taxes. And that is why I've one of the reasons why I've reached out to my guest today, because this guy has got a he's killing it on Twitter. He's killing it on Instagram. I don't know anything about both of them. So we're going to talk about social media. We're going to talk about taxes. We're going to talk about money. He's already shooting shots. We're going to talk about <laughs> retirement. It's espresso. So, it's espresso. espresso. Okay. So, uh, Ron Carruthers, uh, appreciate you, uh, joining us today. Uh, excited to be here. Hey man, we're talking about taxes. That's like one of my favorite things to chat about. So you didn't have to ask me twice. <laughs> so, uh, so tell, uh, tell our audience a, a little bit about you and what you do for people. Um, so I have been in around tax and finances for my career, which is over 30 years long. I basically got into it right out of school. And my fascination was always like, what do the wealthy do to pay the least amount of taxes possible? And very importantly, not go to jail and not end up in trouble with the IRS breathing down their neck. And so... I realized going to school to be a CPA, um, well, they didn't teach that, which is shocking because that's what you think they go to school for. Right. And, and there's a saying we have in our office, which is the tax code is about 81,000 pages long right now. 30 of those pages show you what to pay. The other, okay, I got to do the math now, 80,970 pages show you all the exceptions. And I don't want to say loopholes, but but the exceptions to the rule and where not to pay, but most tax professionals are educated on the 30, not the other 80,000 plus. And so that's kind of our focus is both on the tax and financial side is showing our clients and anyone who will listen to me on social media or on interviews like this, what they can do to lower their taxes, improve their finances. That's it. That's yeah, my I have Tom, Tom will write, you know, Kiyosaki's CPA. I've had him on the interviewed him a couple of times. And when he t initially told me that what you just said, uh, I was like, I, I thought it was the opposite. I thought it was 30 pages about the loopholes and the rest, how to pay taxes. So that's, but, you know, he was always big talking about, hey, the government wants to partner with us. They want us to be our partners in opening small businesses, in uh, real estate, anything that we can do to provide them more taxes. You know, if we employ people that's it. and they're going to pay more taxes, if I go buy an apartment building, you know, that's that's more for them. So that that's pretty cool that that uh, that your your whole business focuses on that. Yeah, it was it was kind of something we fell into. Um, and because people kept asking about it. And so that's mm -hmm. when we as a firm got determined to go learn as much as we could about it. And it's never ending because yeah. the tax code changes, you know, every year, in many cases, multiple times a year. So yeah, it but it's fun, right? Yeah. All right. So, so if I'm a if I'm a doctor out there, a dentist, a high income earner. I'm making a lot of money. I'm making yep. three, four, five hundred thousand, maybe yep. more a year. I'm paying a buttload of taxes. What are some things that that I could do maybe from a because I mean, 99% of the people I talk to, their accountant, they always say, Well, they just do my taxes for me. Tell me what I need to pay. There's no strategy involved. So, what are some things that that You're person be twitched can do. just saying that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing to keep in mind is tax season starts the minute the year starts. It doesn't start after the fact. So in other words, the number one thing you want to do that any, anybody, whether you're, you're a medical professional, you know, making that income or anybody else that wanders onto this, you want to start your tax planning right now. Whenever you're listening to this, it's right now, okay. because what a lot of people set themselves up for failure, failure for is they only think about taxes the least amount possible, and they only do it at tax time, and then they're just thankful that they've got another 364 days that they don't have to think about it. But the fact is, if you're even a little bit successful, 
your number one expense will always be taxes in your in the in your life and you at least if you have kids like i know you got at least one kid because i saw him bring you a tea before we started i got three of them the kids at least move out eventually hopefully and move off of the payroll they graduate college they go on and have their own lives taxes are going to be there forever and the more you make the more of your income proportionally that they're going to take from you and um, the less write-offs that you'll have because they begin to do away with some of those. So the very first thing that I would say is start thinking about your taxes now so you can proactively plan for them and understand things like marginal versus effective rates. Can would you explain you... that? Can you explain yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. It's literally the number one test that we, we ask all of our clients. Yeah. Is do you know the difference between marginal and effective tax rates? Do, do most of them do? No, nobody knows it. We all okay. slept through civics. I slept through that class too. I wasn't interested in taxes when I was in high school. I didn't pay any, so it didn't matter. You know, but the difference is effective is your average rate. So what does if you make four hundred thousand and you paid a hundred thousand dollars in taxes? your effective rate is 25%, right? Okay. That's just the math. Okay. But if you dive in a little deeper, what you realize is you're probably paying closer to 35% on the last dollar that you earn. Just picture a staircase. So once you make your income and get all your deductions off and we get to the line that determines taxable income, then from that point forward, it goes 10%, no matter how, how how much you make, your first 20,000-ish as a married couple is always 10%, then 12, up to about 80,000, mm -hmm. then 20, it's a bigger jump to 22, then 24, then another big jump to 32, 35, and ultimately 37 as we record this. Although the government has a sneaky way of slapping on net investment income tax and things like that, that kind of raise it even more. And then if you live in a high tax state like I do, California, they've got to get their piece also. Yeah. Now, the reason that's relevant is because any strategic planning that you do during the year or after the year comes off that highest rate. So in other words, because it's staircased up, that's bad, although it's good because you're successful, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it's bad because you're paying a higher percentage. But if we do any planning, it comes off that marginal rate, not the average rate, because it's coming off the highest amount. Yeah, Does that make any of, sense? What's that? Yeah, Does that, that make that, sense? That, that, makes, that <laughs> does make sense. Because people say, I'll pay. 30%, I pay 40% taxes. You know, you're you're talking about just the overall, not the not the you're talking about the effective, not the marginal. Right. That's your average amount. But yeah. if you dive in deeper, you'll find, hey, the last dollar you earned on the mm -hmm. last day of the year, you know, we've got clients in California that are up to 60, 65%. By the time you factor in the things that the government has taken away, the things that the state has added. Now that's not their average but that's the last dollar on December 31st that they earned right before midnight, before the new year started. I can remember I was either in dental school or in my residency and I was at like a, a Christmas party and there was like two other successful doctors or dentists or whatever. And they were having this con heated, almost heated conversation of uh, kind of poking their chest out. It was the end of the year. And one of them was saying, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, you know, we had a great year this year. I don't even remember what the numbers were. So it was like more money than I thought that I could even make. One of them said, yeah, man, we had a great year this year. I paid like three fifty in taxes. I was like, and then the other guy was like, man, we paid like 500,000 in taxes. So, <laughs> but the, 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 here's the crazy thing. We get in our mind that the more we make, the higher our taxes should be, which, which kind of shows our success. At least that's, that's the doctor world. But when I read the cash flow quadrant about yeah. how I make money, that 
it's just like, you got to see all these patients, you got to work all these shifts, you got to work all these longer hours. And like you said, the it's stair step that higher you're up, the more taxes you paid. And instead of working smarter and getting it down and getting on that right side, being a business owner or an investor. Correct. And what, would you agree with that? Getting that mindset 100%, shift? 100%. My, my firm we like messy taxes. And the number one thing that I tell anybody that comes to us is, look, if you're just a W-2 employee, even a high salary W-2, you've got a very minimal amount of things that we can do for you. And there's stuff we can do. Yeah. There's absolutely stuff we can do to bring it down that isn't just put more in your 401k or buy a bigger house so you get a bigger interest deduction. There's things that can be done. But the minute that you cross over into some sort of ownership, whether it's your own practice, a side hustle, literally we have clients doing the craziest things as their side hustles, um, or doing some of the real estate investing, whether it's passive or active, now you open up a whole list of deductions and things that we can go through that will again lower what you're paying and what we say is for every dollar you earn there's only three things that can happen to it you're going to pay taxes on it you're going to spend it you're going to save it that's it there's a ratio but if we can lower the taxes even a little bit and for a lot of our clients we can lower it five and in some cases six figures and again you guys can do this on your own just learning how this works and not just outsourcing it to an accountant um, yeah. or a firm that isn't actively working with you and meeting with you and acting like that financial, you know, chief financial officer of your household, if you will, yeah. to come in and help do that. Then now, I mean, we just look at how many shifts do you have to make if we can, if you can drop your tax bill by 40,000 a year. And it was 350. All right, well, you're still paying them 310. You're paying them a lot of money. But a $40,000 drop, let's work that out. And how many shifts or how much of your time did you buy back for the same work? Yeah. So, you know, and at the end of the day, that's it. And like you said, the government is willing to partner with you because they know that, hey, business is what drives everything. And every small business Every big business was once a small business. So. Yeah, I think if, think if people put things in perspective of, like you just said, time, it's not, hey, I want to, you know, this accumulation 401k method to get to be 70 years old and that I may or may not be healthy to enjoy it. And then what if the stock market's doing, you know, my, uh, and I know too many people that get to the point where they're, they retire and then they're not healthy enough to travel or, or whatever. So I'm trying to get people to think about this in all, at least for me, it's just time freedom. It's what, what cash flow can I get now to replace my expenses? And then you can work as optional, right? Sure. Sure. And I think I, I can't speak to your people. A lot of us love what we do. I, I certainly do. But I'm my own boss, so I have really good working conditions because I dictate them. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of us love what we do, but necessarily don't want to necessarily have to work the hours that we have to do to sustain the lifestyle that our family needs, particularly when the government is taking a disproportionate amount from you versus mm -hmm. what they would do anybody else. So, right. Um, so getting back to our first question about what was the first question? <laughs> first question was about the, the, little the, person, that's, the, the person that's getting taxed, the, the doctor or the high income earner is getting taxed. And the first, your first suggestion is start tax planning, start off. Start okay. Now. that That's yeah, number whatever one. Now is when you hear this, that's the day you start. Okay. So let's, let's, what, what would you say? Maybe a, a, another, another couple of suggestions would be. You have, you have to, if, even if you're employed, like we have clients that are anesthesiologists, I was looking at some tax returns right now from, um, a brand new client. I'll meet with him on Thursday that, um, he's a doctor, she's a doctor, both W2s mm -hmm. 
And she was able to set it up and work it out with her malpractice and all that stuff, which that's out of my pay grade, but she was able to work it out so she could see a handful of private patients and have them pay her directly. So now we open up the entire playbook again of what can she write off, mm -hmm. which is now part of her car, part of her cell phone, a home office deduction, paying her kids. Um, I true. even, it's a little bit out of our, 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 the time that we have today, but I, I've even taught, I teach to CPAs how to write off the entire tuition of college for their clients. There is a legitimate way to do it. And so again, for someone in those tax brackets, mm -hmm. that saves them on a $40,000 tuition. If the whole cost of college right now is say 70 to private school and 40, 45 of it is, is tuition. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of tax breaks that lower income earners get that a higher income earner doesn't you can go back and recapture those. And it can be worth ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars a year in tax savings to you. Mm -hmm. Now, again, on an overall bill of six figures, that's not a huge amount, but those are net dollars. So to equal those, you'd have to go work and make thirty to net fifteen. Well, that works out to say one year of tuition off. So paying kids is huge. Being able to now write off. If we can tie it to a business legitimately, and again, the key word to all of this is we're not trying to pull shenanigans. We're operating within the IRS's rule book. Um, but if we can write off a vacation um, or seeing family or tie it somehow to business, now airfare becomes a write-off and part of the hotel at least food, those sorts of things of stuff that you were going to do anyways, or already spending money on now becomes legitimate business deductions. If yeah, it's done yeah. correctly, by the way, the whole thing that got me interested in this, I kind of told you the story. We met a guy when I was 23. That was a high powered attorney that had retired that was now an Amway distributor for Amway. Right. And everybody's heard of Amway, right? And he would get all these crazy people to sign up for Amway, dentists, other lawyers, college professors. And it was like, why? Like, no disrespect if any of you guys are in Amway, but why? And he goes, Ron, the tax savings. He's like, if they work for a college or a hospital or a medical group, or they're just getting a W-2, now I can show this person how to write off all these other things by making Amway their business. And he goes, so they sign up for Amway. Well, we didn't have back then, you know, there wasn't, the internet was barely being born. So there were all these other opportunities, but that's what actually got me interested in taxes in the first place. It was like, man, there's something to this. Hmm. So there's a whole list of things that go on that list there. Um, but anyway, that's yeah, the- I, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I hear from, people that come to me is their w-2 they um they don't have a lot of write-offs what can they do a lot of them will want to get into real estate maybe with syndications that sort of thing what sort of write-offs do they get and then i'm like well you know make sure you work with your tax professional because you know i'm not a tax professional but they're so limited but like you said if they can find a way to get a side hustle or another business that helps right Totally. Yeah. It's just, again, the, the tax rules were saying it for like the fourth time. So sorry about that. Tax rules were written for the self-employed individual or the business owner, the real estate investor, the stock investor, mm -hmm. they were not written. If you think about it, when the IRS first started in 1913, um, I think the statistic was 85 to 90% of America was self-employed. 
Hmm. So, and since then we've, we've gone way the other direction where most of us, particularly, you know, in the, the years after the um, Dow, the, the market crash of 1929, people then began to lose family farms, lose businesses. They went to work for bigger employers. And so, but the original intent was to provide protection for the self-employed. So we don't want to leave a job that's paying you several hundred thousand dollars a year. But even a little bit of time spent on a side hustle or looking at investing strategies can give open up some of those things to really make the money that you're working on your Monday through Friday job, you get to keep more of it. Again, it only goes three places, taxes, saving, spendings, gotcha. right? Less to taxes means more for the other two. So we've, we've talked about taxes a good bit. Let's shift gears and end on account investments and whether or not somebody wants to retire early or maybe they want to cut back or they don't want to retire at their traditional you know 65 or 67 do you have some maybe recommendations as, <clears throat> as we're working as we're you know raising kids and all that different places different buckets to put our money to be as tax advantaged as possible yeah so couple things to think about. Number one is traditional wisdom isn't always what gets people where they want to go. Let me give you a perfect example. One of the biggest things that came out that a lot of people don't even realize isn't even 50 years old is the 401k and the IRA. Those didn't exist 50 years ago. Those are relatively new. They came out in the 70s. And they came out during a time when top tax rates were 70 in the 70%. Jeez. <laughs> right? Don't forget the taxes have gone as high as 94%. Was that in California? No, that was federally. <laughs> that was a joke. California, yeah, the California came along that you would go for a job at, at, at back in the 40s if you were in California and you'd have to, you'd, they'd take all of your paycheck and you'd have to owe them money by the time the feds <laughs> in California got done. <laughs> You know, man, like we were talking about before, at least the weather's nice here. My friends in New York, you know, that pay equally high taxes are like, hey, man, how's the weather? They're like, weather sucks. <laughs> so we at least get good weather and, and surf yeah, um, and fish tacos. But anyway, so loading up, even though the traditional wisdom is load up your set plan, if you're allowed to have one, throw a cash balance plan on top of it. And if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, they're just ways of saving money above and beyond your 401k that are tax deferred if you own a business. So you're taking, you're not paying tax on it now, but what you're doing is you are paying tax on what you deferred, everything it makes at whatever rate Congress decides you're going to pay at that time. And what a lot of people don't realize is, um, oh, what's his name? I think it's Ted Benga. Yeah. Benna. Ted Benna was yep. the guy who invented the 401k. And he's mm -hmm. the guy that's like, it's a monster. I, 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 I didn't it. realize it was going to turn into this. Yeah. Yep. So you have to understand like, look, this isn't a hate America because I love it here. My people came from Scotland. I don't want to go back to Scotland. Uh, but Congress doesn't do things necessarily to benefit you or I. It's kind of to push their own agendas. And they figured out that if they let people defer taxes starting in the 70s, they would actually collect more revenue down the road. That was kind of the intention behind it. So we at least encourage for our clients that are making lots of money or even not making a lot of money, look for things that you will grow tax free and can be withdrawn tax free down the road to at least balance off because again remember taxes are staircased mm -hmm. so if all of it's taxable and congress decides we're going back to the good old days where taxes were 70 percent or higher as a top rate well you can benefit the top rate 70 percent everybody's rate goes up to match it so even if you're not in that top grade in retirement, you're still going to get hit by that. So we, and this sounds crazy, um, but it's worth pursuing 
we like 7702 plans for our clients for a portion of their money, which is the internal revenue code that allows you to structure a cash value life insurance contract to behave like a Roth IRA. And that is actually where they got the original idea for the Roth IRA from. And again, I know a lot of you hearing that are like, what? That's a scam. It's a ripoff. Trust me, as a tax professional, I spent three years back in the 90s trying to prove that that was a scam. At three years. I was convinced I was going to show my friends who were recommending it to their clients that they were wrong. They were ripping them off and, and they should they should be you know, hit for malpractice, financial malpractice. After three years, I had to be like, you know what? You guys are right. I'm wrong. I should be recommending this as a portion to my clients. So again, don't dismiss it out of hand. Like, nope, that doesn't apply to me. Yeah. Um, because particularly for people that want to retire early, if it is set up correctly and it has to be set up correctly, you don't have a lot of the restrictions that you have with 401ks and set plans and IRAs where you can't access them until you're in your 59 and a half, or you have to follow such onerous IRS rules. There's your SAT word for the day, onerous. <laughs> um, they have a way for you to access them early without penalty, but the rules are so strict. I mean, I've explained it to many of my clients over the years, and only a couple of them have actually followed through with it on using a rule like 72T, which lets you take a premature distribution from your 401k or IRA. You have to pay the tax on it, but you don't have to pay the penalty. But it's so strict and you have to do it for so many years in a row and one variation and you undo the whole thing and no tax on everything. You're much better off having another source to go to. And I know, I know it sounds crazy. I feel crazy when I say it myself, but when you look at the math behind it, there is tactical reasons for at least not dismissing it. Um, we recommend a lot of our clients look at asset back pensions which is a way if you're not in a hospital or medical group that gives you a pension, you actually get guaranteed income when you retire to take some of that market risk off the table. And we, we tell our clients to invest in, you know, rentals and real estate and syndications and look at all those things. We're big fans of that because you get certain tax advantages for that. And you get other income that is guaranteed. And diversification is the name of the game, mm -hmm. but it's diversifying among different strategies, not having five different mutual funds that all buy the same top 10 holdings. That's not diversification. Right. So anyway, that's kind of my rant on that. Probably shouldn't have had that last shot of espresso, Jeff. I don't know. <laughs> no worries. Well, uh, I, should have, I should have switched to decaf a little earlier in the day. What are you going to do? So, so we we did the tax, we did investments. Um, I, I'm in, and I, like I mentioned earlier, I, I'm really liking your stuff on Twitter, on Instagram. I mean, the, the stuff. Like when I first heard what you did, like I'm like, there's nobody out there that's either a, an accountant or a financial planner or anybody like that that's putting out just like the common sense stuff that you do. So if people want to learn more about you, um, some of the different areas that you can help them with, where, where can they go find you? Just the two places that I'm most active are Twitter, which is my name, Ron Carruthers, um, just spell it right and you'll you'll get me on Instagram. Look for Ron O. Carruthers. Just that. And Twitter's great about imposter accounts. They'll throw them off on Instagram. Um, I will not DM you unless you direct message me first. And if you want to find me, you can direct message me on either of those spots. We yeah. have a website, but we actually need to redo it. So it's Ron Carruthers if you want to see me a little bit chubbier and um, with some of the photos on there. But we got to redo that whole thing. Go if you want to chat. 
hit me up on Instagram or on Twitter. Just make sure you've got my account on Instagram, Ron O. Carruthers. And if you get an email or a direct message in the middle of the night asking about your crypto strategy, I promise you that's not me. I'm asleep in the middle of the night. We have like 10 imposter accounts on there and Instagram is pretty slow about removing them if they remove them at all. But um, if anybody wants to chat about it, or just have us take a look at their situation and, and take a look at what's going on, happy to do that. So they're more than welcome to reach out and on either of those platforms and um, we can go from there and we'll see, whoa, I didn't want to do that. I think I did something bad there. Um, yeah, we're happy to chat with you and hopefully you'll enjoy some of the content on there. We, we record videos, we put on Twitter, what they call an article, because it's all short, it's called a thread. Um, I have a bunch of threads on there on tax savings, mortgages, putting kids through college, paying the least amount of taxes, setting up your finances. Hopefully you guys will find all that useful. And um, yeah, if you wanna reach out, feel free to, and hopefully you'll give us a follow over there. Um, I think you'll enjoy the content. Online. Yeah, I'm definitely enjoying it. And, and uh, everybody, I'll put his links below this video. So uh, you don't have to worry about looking for them. You can just click on the link below here to, to go check out Ron. So Ron, thanks again for all your wisdom. And uh, keep up the good work. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much for having on me. You guys can obviously tell I hate talking about this. It's terrible <laughs> for me. You know, this is what we do. And, and we like helping people get their finances in order, save on taxes. So anytime you want to have me back, I am more than happy. If your followers demand it, if the people demand it, I will be happy to come back and chat again. So don't be shy about reaching out, Jeff. Awesome. Thank you again thanks for again. having me. It was a joy.